Father. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your grace, and your mercy, O oh, Father. Jesus, keep me true. Keep me true, Lord Jesus, keep me true. There's a race that I must run. There are victories to be won. Give me power every hour to be true. Keep me true, Lord Jesus, keep me true. Keep me true, Lord Jesus, keep me true. There's a race that I must run, there are victories to be won. Give me power every hour to be true. Keep me true, Lord Jesus, keep me true. Keep me true, Lord Jesus, keep me true. There's a Keep me true, Lord Jesus, keep me true. Keep me true, Lord Jesus, keep me true. There's a race that I must run, there are riches to be won. Give me power every hour to be true. Keep me true, Lord Jesus, keep me true. There's a race that I must run, there are victories to be won. Give me power every hour to be true. He's a wonderful Savior to me. He's a wonderful Savior to me. I was lost in sin, but Jesus took me. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Friday evening service of the Gospel Assembly Church, Kuna. It's really true that we were chosen in God for redemption's plan. And chosen in God, I'll follow the Lamb who loved me and who saved me and taught me to pray. And, and that's what He's a wonderful Savior to all of us saints. There's no one like Him. There is no one like, like Jesus, our Savior. There's no one like God, our Father. I was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. Uh, he took me in not just to not just to uh, see to it that I live in my sin, uh, but He not only took me out from the dregs of sin, but He cleansed me. He cleans me uh, from those stains of sin, uh, not from not only from the past, uh, from the past life of mine, and not only from the from the of uh, sin, a sinful life that we lived before coming to God but he also helps me 
uh, to take victory over sin. Uh, that, that's why he's a wonderful savior. He doesn't keep me in my sin any longer. Uh, he doesn't want me to stay deceived, but he wants me to rise above sin. He wants me to rule over sin. That's what he told the first uh, children uh, of, of Adam and Eve. He told Cain uh, that he told, uh, he told uh, God told Cain that if thou doest well, uh, will thou not be accepted? And he said that if uh, the sin lieth at the door, but thou shalt rule over sin. That's that, and that's the same desire of God our Father even to, even today. Uh, is the same desire, saints, and we need to give heed to that. Uh, we need to take heed that we are not deceived. Uh, we need to take heed that if we don't err or walk away from that. From that, from that salvation. Salvation is not just saving us from our past sins and forgiving us. Salvation is complete freedom from a life of sin. And that's why Jesus came. He came to save us from sin. Uh, from that, that, that salvation's plan. Uh, uh, that's, that's, what, that's what redemption means. I'm redeemed. I'm redeemed from my, from my sins. I'm redeemed from my past life. I'm redeemed not to live in that life any longer, but redeemed to serve God. Redeemed to walk in the footsteps of our uh, Savior Jesus. And there is so much that people are talking uh, even today about, about faith. Uh, faith is a topic that, that's, uh, uh, that's mostly preached. Uh, if you see, uh, if you pick up uh, any sermon, uh, that's the most simple and the most uh, easy topic to preach on where you can catch the fish. Uh, just believe in the, on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Have faith. Abraham believed and it was counted unto him for righteousness. And so many scriptures are, that are quoted, but that's only half the truth. Uh, the scripture I was just meditating on here in the book of Hebrews. Uh, Hebrews and chapter 3. Paul is writing here to the, to the Hebrews and he says here in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12. He says, take heed brethren, if the scripture, um, as we looked upon a phrase last time, that do we not know? Uh, this is one more phrase saying that we need to see. Uh, whenever the scripture starts with these words, take heed, uh, it, it, it's, it must be important. That's why it's written there. That's why it's put in there. Uh, and it says, take heed brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. And people talk a lot about faith and they quote this scripture that we don't need to have a heart of unbelief. We just need to um, have faith and believe in the Lord. And they, and they speak about John the 10th chapter where Jesus said that all that my father giveth me uh, come unto me. And my sheep knoweth my voice and, and all, that my all that my father give me Come unto me, and I will not lose any one of them. And my Father which gave them me is greater than I, and he won't lose any one of them. So, so that's what they talk about, the double, double security of, of Jesus and our Father. Uh, but here, in Hebrews chapter 3, and verse 12, this shows me uh, that, uh, that, that even though there is security mentioned about in John chapter 10, that yes, Jesus secures me, and the Father secures me, and he says no one can pluck them out. Of my hand and no one can pluck them out of my father's hand that's that's right no one can pluck us out saints not even the devil no one can pluck us out of the hands of Jesus and God our father but here it says in Hebrews 3 and verse 12 that take heed brethren lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. This scripture shows me that I, by my unbelief, can walk away or depart from God. No one can pluck me, that's true. But I can walk away from the presence of God. No one can pluck me out of God's hands, not even the devil. That's true, but unbelief is so deadly. <clears throat> that if I, if I keep walking that way, I can depart from God. 
<coughs> and let's let's be careful saying that unbelief shouldn't make us to doubt God. <coughs> Excuse me, or doubt God's word, or doubt the works of the Lord. Again, we are speaking about faith here, and and we know Hebrews talks a lot about faith. And uh, in the eleventh chapter, we call it the <coughs> Hall of Faith. Uh, but in I believe the verse six, if I'm not mistaken, Hebrews eleven and verse six. Uh, says that without faith <clears throat> it is impossible to please the Lord and people think that just having faith in Christ and his redemptive work at Calvary is enough and they build our whole life around it they build a whole movement they build a whole church around it but James makes a statement here in James the second chapter <clears throat> James chapter 2 and verse 14 James says what does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? Can just having faith save us? That's what James is asking. And that's what, let's ask that question to ourselves. And let's ask that question to every, um, every deceptive word that we hear men speak from the pulpits out there in the world. Just have faith, believe in the Lord, uh, have faith and you will be saved. But James says, and he is James, the half-brother of our Lord Jesus. And he says, can faith, uh, can faith save him, James 2 verse 40. And it says in, again in verse uh, 17, let's read, even so faith, if it hath not works, it is dead, being alone. Faith is not supposed to be alone. Faith has to go hand in hand with works. It's not good for a man to dwell alone, God says. And I think God even talks the same thing about faith. It's not good that a man have faith alone. See, but works have to go hand in hand. In verse 18, Yea, a man may say, that's we, Thou hast faith and I have works. But James says, Show me your faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works a faith that does not lead to work is there and i believe that work is the work of obedience the work of faith is obedience faith is proved by obedience when it the scripture says abraham uh, believed and it was accounted unto him for righteousness that word believed implies believing and obeying because if you if you read the life of abraham it was not just faith my dear brothers and sisters it was faith coupled with works and that works was obedience a work of obedience moment by moment living by god's word faith commit by hearing and hearing by the word <coughs> but those words when they ask me to do something i do it and that's a proof of my faith that's a fruit of my faith and that's obedience so faith is important but i need to keep obeying day by day day by day till the end believing in jesus and why he came is good and we need to believe we need to believe in the redemptive work of our savior jesus but the faith, that faith now should lead me to obedience. And that is also daily obedience, following God by his words that he has spoken. That's very, very important. The word of God always tests our obedience. If we, if we see, if we read scriptures throughout, right from the book of Genesis and right to the last book, the book of Revelation, God demands obedience. Obedience to God means dying to self. You cannot, a child can never obey his or her parents without denying himself or herself. It's hard for a child to obey. And it's hard for a child to obey immediately. It's hard for a child to obey completely. And since we correct our children, but, but can we introspect our own selves? That do we obey God immediately? And do we obey God completely? As the word of God always tests our obedience. Obedience to God, as I said, means dying to self. It's not easy. But all of God's children 
get there eventually. For God worketh in me both to will. That's that's something to do with our desire. That's something to do with our faith. And to do, that's works. His, his will. For God worketh in us both to will and to do. Both to give us faith and to also show our works. And, and obey his word and do his will. And sometimes God asks us to do something saying that's completely against what we have learned from our childhood or what the world has taught us or what uh, educational institutes teach us or what even the preachers out there in the world teach us. God asks us to do that's, that's completely, uh, completely opposite to the, to the tide of this world and human understanding. Just to give an example, God says, love your enemies. In Matthew uh, chapter 5. He says, do good to them that, that use you. Pray for them that, that despitefully use you. Let's, let's read that scripture. I believe all these things are just in one verse. So it won't take much time. Here in Matthew chapter 5. Let's read Matthew chapter 5. And let me see the verse. It says Matthew chapter 5 and verse 44. But I say unto you, that's the words of Jesus himself. And Jesus said, I never say anything unless I first hear my father say that. So, so, so this, these are the words of God Almighty, God our Father. He says, but I say unto you, love your enemies. Well, that's completely opposite than what the world teaches. Bless them that curse you. Can we do this? That's completely opposite than what the world and what, what even people teach us outside. Do good to them that hate you. Can we? Can we do good to them that hate us? And pray for them. Not just your family members, your children and your spouse and your friends and the ones that love you and, and, and the ones that do good to you. Jesus said pray for them which despitefully use you and it doesn't stop there. He goes ahead and says and pray for them which persecute you. Well, tell me, which institution teaches this? Which institution? Love. God always demands, or God always asks us to love the unlovable, and to do good, and to be good to the not-so-goods, and to the no-goods. Be good to the no-goods. Do good to the no-goods. And love the unlovable. Can we obey these words? Can we immediately and can we completely, saints, it takes a lifetime to come to this level of Matthew 5 and verse 44. I'm telling you by experience, I'm telling you that I fall short of this verse every day. But I don't intend to stay where I am, saints. And I hope we all won't stay where we are. He is saving us day by day. And every day, saints, should be better than the day before. Every day, I obey God a little more, a little more, where there will be complete obedience worked out in me. Not when I am dying, not when I am about to die, but I want to live a life of complete obedience. I want to live a life of total, complete and immediate obedience to God and His Word. See, we don't, when we don't obey the, uh, the scriptures, when we don't obey this, we depart from God. And that's what Paul was saying. Take heed, lest in any one of us an evil heart of unbelief. Oh, this scripture is not for me. Oh, the scripture is for him. The scripture is for her. The scripture is for them. It's not for me. That's an evil heart of unbelief. And when we don't obey these words and when we think just faith is enough, and obedience is okay. Now I'll do it when I feel like. I do. I'll do it when, uh, when, when things are okay. When, when my circumstances are, 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 are pleasant. Uh, I'll do it when I feel like doing it. Well, that's not obedience. That's still disobedience. And 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 that's how we depart from God. We depart from that uh, uh, newness of life. We depart from that walking in the newness. See, people in the world talk so much about a new life. Born again, born again, born again. That's a phrase that is so loosely used in Christianity today. 
believers, believers and born again, born again, so loosely used. Oh, I have been born again. Uh, uh, God's given me a new life, a new life. And new life is being preached. But Bible doesn't talk just about new life things. Bible talks about walking in the newness of life. Am I walking in that life? And what's that? What's the newness of life? What's it? That is the life of Jesus. Am I walking in the footsteps of my Savior? That's your new life. That's 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 obedience. That's proof a proof of my faith. That's faith coupled with works. Otherwise, it's all dead. It's all dead sense. Let's let's not produce death in our spiritual lives. Let's let's walk in the newness of life. Let's not depart from the uh, from from God and from the new and the living way. Uh, see, we, let's not let's stop blaming the devil for everything. Oh, the devil made me do this. The devil uh, tempted me. The devil uh, has uh, has taken a hold of of situations, and I I, I just. See, sometimes, I don't know if I say, say this, but sometimes I feel bad for the devil that we put all the blame on him. That's okay, he's, he's, he, uh, he, he's the originator of, uh, of, of sin. That's, that's, that's completely, completely true. But it's not the devil sins that makes us go away. Now man, uh, the scripture says, uh, is, is, um, is tempted when he's drawn away. Uh, let let not a man say when he's tempted that I am tempted of God. See where the, the scripture I believe uh, is it in James? Yes, James chapter one and verse thirteen. Let no man say when he's tempted I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Uh, but let's not make a statement of the devil also every time. See, but James says in verse fourteen that but every man is tempted. When he or she is drawn away, see how, how an evil heart of unbelief, how disobedience draws us away. Drawn away of his own lust and enticed. See, it's, so, so God may be wanting us to forgive. God may be wanting us to love. God may be wanting us to do good to the person who has hurt us the most. And what do we do then? What do we do when God asks us to love the unlovable? What do we do when God asks us to do good that hate us? What do we do when God asks us to pray for them that despitefully use us and persecute us? What do we do when God's word um, uh, commands us to do these things? Saints, what do we do? Do we stay the way we are or do we obey those words or do we depart? From those words do we just turn a deaf ear to those words and and say that that's not for me I have valid reasons to hate that person I have valid reasons uh, to to not pray for them I have valid reasons to uh, to not even look at their face that's what we say. That's what. That's our justification. Well, saints, Jesus had all the valid reasons to avoid the cross, and God had all the valid reasons to leave us in sin and choose someone else instead of us. God had all the valid reasons. We have all the valid reasons to give evil for evil, and we even collect a clique around us. And when we speak to them and that click speaks back to us and says, you're right, brother, you're right, sister, you, it's okay, we will pray for you, we will pray for you. That's not a click that Jesus would like around him. That's not something that Jesus told his disciples that, yeah, I just, uh, you, 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 you are right. You're not supposed to love them. You're not supposed to love them. Just leave them alone. Don't even look at their face. Uh, pray that something bad and wish something bad happens to them. Well, that's not, that's not, that's not a life of faith. No saints. Let's, 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 let's understand what God wants from his church. When we call ourselves the body of Christ, do we really live like the physical body of Christ lived 2000 years ago? 
like the way he forgave the unforgivable, like the way he loved the unlovable, the way he did good to the no goods. There's an there's a example in the word of God, I hope I'm not taking much time, about Jonah. There, I would like to spend a little few minutes here looking at the book of Jonah. And Jonah of all the prophets was asked to go and warn the enemy of Israel. Nineveh uh, was, was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. It was a great city. Uh, jo uh, Nineveh in the book of Jonah is called the great city. It was a big city. It was it was a metro metro uh, of those times. It was it was it was a cosmopolitan city of that time. It was a big city, and 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 the Syrians were were the the enemies of Israel. And Jonah was in the northern tribe of Israel, the, um, uh, to the ten uh, in the ten northern tribes, and and he was asked of God to go and warn the Assyrians, the enemies. But Jonah was a man who believed God. Jonah was a man who had faith in God and faith in the creation of God and faith in the uh, omnipotence of God. He, he knew because he makes, he testifies about this in Jonah chapter 1 and 9. Uh, and he said unto them, I am an Hebrew. I fear the Lord. See his testimony, the God of heaven which made the sea and the dry land. So, so Jonah was a man of faith. But if you read the book of Jonah, you will see that he didn't have works to prove his faith. He disobeyed God's word. Here in Jonah chapter 1 and verse 2, God tells Jonah, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. That was the word of God. That was no, not the word of any man. Jonah knew the difference between the word of God and the words of men. He knew it. He knew it. And but, but verse 3, Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish, from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof. It was a ship, it was not just a small boat because I believe Tarshish was way far uh, from, from where Jonah was. Uh, I don't know the exact um, uh, distance, studied it long back, but I believe it was far away from, from Nineveh. Nineveh was close by. But Tarshish was far. So he wanted to go as far as he could go away from the presence of God. And, and he even, I think he must have taken all his savings because the true prophets of God during those days were not rich. The false prophets were rich, but the true prophets were always um, not, not very rich. They were poor men. Uh, so, so I believe he, if he paid the fare, he must have paid a hefty amount to get to, to, to Tarshish. And he... He, he, lowered, he, he, he went in and boarded that ship. Okay, so, so, so we all know the story. Let's, uh, everyone knows the story about the Jonah and the fish. Even the small children may be knowing. So we know what happens in verse 4. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea. And there was a mighty tempest. There was a storm now. That the Lord sent. In verse 5, the mariners were afraid and cried every man to his God. Every man, there was a there were heathens around Jonah. He was not with uh, with uh, with uh, with uh, his his own people, the Israelites. There were heathen men, uh, sailors, and and people out there, businessmen, and every man began to began to cry unto his own god, uh, and cast for the waves. They began to unload a few things from the ship, uh, but Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. Jonah is sleeping even when he knew he did something wrong. How many times, saints, we can, uh, we can just overlook things that we have done and disobedience in our lives and still be at rest, per se. He was, he was, he was sleeping and God sends a storm to get his attention. How many times God has to send a storm to get our attention, but we still neglect it and we still are spiritually asleep. No sensitivity. Let's be sensitive to how God works in our life says. Are we asleep when God is trying to show us something? God was trying to show Jonah something, but he was asleep. Let's read. Uh, let's keep on reading in verse 7. And they said and everyone to his fellow, come and let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. 
and they said unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, uh, who are you? What is your occup occupation? From where did you come? What country? What people? And then Jonah gives his testimony in verse 9. But in verse 11, uh, they said unto him, What shall we do unto you? That the sea may become unto us. For the sea wrought and was tempestuous. Uh, tempestuous. And verse 12, And he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you. Saints, Jonah had an option right here. That when he knew that God's trying to get his attention and the Lord is cast into the lap, but the whole disposal thereof is of the Lord. When he knew that God made his name to come up on those lots, he had an option to repent right here and say, God, I am sorry. I am willing to be... I am willing to go to Nineveh. He could have repented and said sorry to God, but he wasn't ready to admit his wrong even now. But was willing to be thrown out in the sea. So how many times we are willing to stay in that, in, in that cursed situation that we are in, but we will never repent. We will not obey. I better stay where I am, but I will not repent. I will not break. I will not budge. I will not obey. And, and Jonah, Jonah chose the, the, the hard, hard part. And since we choose the hard part and then we start to complain, why am I going through all these things? Why, why is life so difficult for me? Well, let's sit and understand why. There's no one to be blamed. There's no God's not to be blamed. Something that we have been insensitive to the nudgings and to the proddings of God and His Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and we've been disobedient and that's why we are going through what we are going through. <clears throat> and here, <clears throat> the, the men in verse 14 and verse 15, they took Jonah and they cast him forth into the sea and the sea stopped from raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. I don't know. Uh, they must have started believing in the true God. <coughs> How God used an, 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 an disobedient man to bring people to him. I don't know what happened to them in the future. But now, verse 17, the Lord had prepared a great fish. Now this is the second thing that the Lord does to get Jonah's attention. The storm was the first. Now the fish is the second. Uh, now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Imagine what ha must have happened to him for three days and three nights. Uh, darkness there uh, inside, waters gushing in and gushing out, uh, all the smell and the stink. Uh, uh, but what again amazes me, saints, that it took him three days and three nights to call on the name of the Lord. Why not the first day? Why not the first hour? Why not the second day? It took him three days and three nights to call on the Lord. Then in verse, in chapter 2. Then Jonah prayed after three days and three nights. Prayed unto the Lord, his God, out of the fish's belly. And then he says all these, makes all these statements that I'm in the belly of hell. And verse 3, thou cast me into the deep. In the midst of the sea, the floods come past me about. Was four and cast out of thy sight. I will look again toward thy temple. The waters come past me. Was five. The depth closed me around. The weeds were wrapped about my head. It was an uncomfortable situation. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. The fish. Uh, I believe. I believe the the fish went deep into the waters. The first day the ship may be at around 100 feet beneath the waters. The pressure was not so much. Uh, and, and God was waiting for Jonah to cry out on the first day. I don't think so he did. He didn't. Then the fish went a little deeper maybe or 200 feet. But Noah still, not, still is not giving up. Still is hard hearted. Still is stubborn. The third day the fish must have gone down deep. 300, 400. And as we know as we go down deep. In the ocean, the water pressure, the pressure there is more than what it is on the surface. And Jonah was feeling that pressure and finally Jonah breaks and surrenders. Since the harder and the stubborn Jonah got, the harder the situation got. 
the harder and the stubborn we get, the harder our adversaries will get and the harder our situations will get. It took Jonah three days to surrender. How long will we take to surrender? How long will we take to obey? God will take us to great depths sometimes to teach us obedience. Let's come to Jonah, the third chapter now. Now, now Jonah came, comes out of, that, of the belly of the fish. And even though here we see was, 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 was one, Jonah 3 was one, and the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, let's, let's start obeying God the first time, saints. Let us start doing that. The word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. See, and we keep on reading, saints, we know that even though Jonah came out of this experience, there was still a bitterness against the people of Nineveh in his heart. That was not set right. See, sometimes we just somehow repent and ask forgiveness from the Lord, but, but the root of bitterness is still there in our hearts. So God has to take us again through some experiences. And that's what happened to Jonah. He came out of one situation, but the bitterness against Nineveh, the, he couldn't still love the unlovable. He couldn't, he couldn't see good happening to his enemies. And in verse 4, chapter 3, And Jonah began to enter into the city, a day's journey, and he cried and, yet, and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. And, and, jo and he cried out in the, in the city, and he thought, that, that nothing will happen, but verse 5, we see that those people turned. They proclaimed a fast, they put on sackcloth. Even the king in verse 6, um, he, he took off his kingly robe and he covered him with sackcloth. Even the animals, they, they did the same thing to the animals even in verse 7. See, though, so, so everyone repented and God forgave them. God forgive them and we see that in chapter 3 and now in verse 4 verse 4 and verse, uh, chapter 4 sorry in chapter 4 of Jonah and verse 1 but it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he was very angry and he prayed to the Lord he was angry and upset because God forgave his enemies how many times we are angry and upset because God doesn't deal uh, with the one who troubles us? How many times, saints, we complain that how come they are living so, uh, so, 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 uh, uh, they are living in pleasure? Why, why is something bad not happening to them? I'm not talking about the people out in the world. Some people in the church, some Christians, maybe our enemies and we really hope heart in heart that something bad should happen to them so that they can understand their mistakes well that's a very dirty filthy spirit that we may have sometimes may not manifest it may not voice it but god looks at the heart and that was the problem in this prophet he was angry and upset because god forgave his enemies and he says in verse was was uh, was two he says uh, oh lord was not this my saying when i was yet in my country therefore i fled unto tarshish i knew that thou art a gracious god and merciful slow to anger and of great kindness and repentest thee of the evil therefore now O lord take i beseech thee my life from me for it is better for me to die than to live that was jonah's solution death is better than life that was his solution Sometimes we make a statement, I am fed up in this world, I want to die. Since we are ready to die, but we are not ready to obey. We are ready to die physically, but we don't want to die to self. And that was Jonah, he was willing to die, but he was not willing to obey. That was his problem. And Jonah's solution was that death is better than life. In verse 4, then said the Lord, Doest thou well to be angry? He says, do you have a reason to be upset? Saints, that's what the question the Lord wants to ask all of us. Do we have a reason to get upset? Because God is not judging someone we hate. Because God has forgiven someone we hate. 
because God is prospering someone we don't like. Do we have a reason to get angry? Who art thou, Paul said, who judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Who are we to judge? Who, 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 who's worthy of my forgiveness or who's worthy of my love? Who are we? That's what God asks Jonah. Doest thou well to be angry? Verse 8, if you see that, now we all know that Jonah went out of the city. Now God prepares a, a, a gourd that comes up and gives him shadow. The next day God prepares a worm um, and he eats it up. And the sun, uh, the scorching heat uh, and the sun beats on the head of Jonah. And again, again, verse 9, and God said unto Jonah, uh, doest thou well to be angry because in verse 8 Jonah again says I wished I wish I was dead it is better for me to die than to live death is better than life Jonah said but what does the scripture says thy loving kindness is better than life Jonah forgot that he wanted death again he says in verse verse 9 again God says now do we have a do you have a reason Jonah to be angry and then you, let's see jo, Jonah's response. Let's see Jonah's response in verse 9. And God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gold? And he said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. See that stubbornness. He is telling God, God, my anger is valid. And since we may not make a statement to God, but we have, we, we, we justify our anger and our, and our hatred in our hearts. We justify it and we say, I am right and that person is wrong. I will never forgive that person. I am right 100%. And that's all. Let's not point fingers at Jonah tonight, saints. Let's put a finger at all of us. There's a little bit of, we always make a statement, there's a little bit of Job in all of us. I'm telling you, there's a, there, there is a lot of Jonah in all of us. Not just a little bit. There's a lot of Jonah in all of us. I believe Jonah must have discussed this with his friends when the Lord spoke, spoke to him. He must have discussed it with his friends and they would have justified Jonah's uh, position. They must have justified Jonah's unforgiveness. But in God's eyes, Jonah was wrong. It's not what people think. We may, we may as I said, we may form a clique around us that thinks we are right. But what does God think? But what if God thinks we are wrong? Since it doesn't matter what people think, it really matters what God thinks. And in the eyes of God, Jonah was wrong. Jonah was rebellious. Jonah was disobedient. It's not what people think, but what God thinks. And the only, only one that knew Jonah was wrong was God. And since that's what matters. That's what matters. Here's the scripture in Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 2. All the ways of a man are clean before clean in his own eyes, but the Lord weigh the spirits. I believe the Living Bible uh, ma uh, paraphrases this, this scripture in a way. It says, All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes, but is the Lord convinced? That's what matters. Is the Lord convinced? It doesn't matter if I'm convinced, if my family is convinced, if, if, the, if the clique around me is convinced, if the whole city and the whole earth is convinced that I am right. Is the Lord convinced that I am right? It didn't matter what people thought about Jonah. Pe people thought Jonah was right, but Lord was not convinced about Jonah because he was still disobedient. He was a grumbling, uh, he was a man who was grumpy. He was a disobedient man. Don't know what happened to him. In, happened to him in the end. But says no use of convincing ourselves. Oh, I, I believe in Jesus. It's okay. I have faith in Jesus. He'll take me through. He'll take me through. Well, what about works? What about obedience? I may convince myself that I'm right, but God, when God, when God looks at me, He looks at a disobedient soul. He looks at a disobedient will, a disobedient desire, a disobedient uh, uh, self-life. He looks at a disobedient lump of flesh. That's what 
God looks at when he looks at me. A disobedient lump of flesh. It's still flesh. It has not been dead. It's not dead to self. We would rather die but submit to the word of God. Since let's not let's not be, be so stubborn. Let's not be so hard hearted. Let's let's obey the word of God. Let's obey God's word. I can speak a lot on these things, a lot of this. But I think this is this is a good thought for us. And I'm not speaking of this by looking at someone else, saints. I'm speaking this by experience. I'm speaking this by experience because I know there's a Jonah in me too. That needs to needs to be thrown out needs to submit to the word of God. I'm not pointing fingers at anyone here tonight. But I'm just opening up my heart to each and every one of us. I hope we see the Jonah in us. He was a prophet. Well, we may be anyone. We may be used of God to do something great. We may convince people that we are right. But is the Lord convinced? Is the Lord convinced let's let's check that out and may the lord bless each and every one of you thank god for this service thank god for the word of god saints the more i study the more i look at the word of god the more i see myself the more i see um, what god desires of me and how i fail him every time i fail him every time but still his mercies are new every morning and there he's waiting for me to change and to turn to him. Well, he, Jonah waited three days. How many days we, we, we will wait? Well, forget days. How many years will we wait until we break? And, 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 and as Nebuchadnezzar realized that it's the Lord that ruleth amongst the nations and the kingdoms. And it's the law that has his way, whether it pertains to a man or a nation. It's the Lord. Saints, it's the Lord that has sent that storm. In the form of that sickness or the job or that person in your life. It's the Lord that has sent the storm. It's the Lord that has prepared that fish for us. Let's cry out to the Lord. Let's empty, our, empty out our hearts of all disobedience. And wrath and anger and clamor and malice and envy and jealousy. Let's put to death the works of the flesh. And let's bear. Let's bear the fruit of the spirit. See that's very important. And obedience is the soil. Obedience is not mentioned as one of the fruit. Obedience and humility are not mentioned in the fruit of the spirit in Galatians 5. Obedience and humility are the soil from which that fruit is produced. Let's, let's be obedient. The willing and obedient shall eat the good of the land. Let's, be, let's not be a grumpy uh, person who obeys. Let's not obey the Lord and be upset. Can we obey the Lord and rejoice with whatever happens after that? Can we obey the Lord and rejoice? Can, can we obey God and not get upset with what happens, with what the result is later? Can we obey God and, and rejoice in Him? Or, can we, or do we obey God and get upset? Let's, let's, let's think that. Let's think about that. And may the Lord give us understanding. May the Lord grant us understanding. Consider what I say. And may the Lord give each and every one of us understanding. To live the way God wants us to live. Amen. Thank the Lord for this service. Thank you all for, for, for being here online. Let's continue to pray for, for all the prayer requests. Let's not forget to pray for the work in the church going on. Oh, it's coming up really well. Uh, let's continue to pray for the work there. And let's continue to pray for all the all the weekend services throughout the body of Christ. Let's continue to remember Brother and Sister Senji. And let's continue to remember all our brothers and sisters that are maybe maybe affected with this COVID-19 virus in this in this body. 
Let's ask the Lord to touch them and heal them too. Amen. Let's all pray. Father, thank you for the light of your word that shines so bright. Even today, saints, oh, Lord, after so many years, the word it still helps us, oh God. The light still shines. And Father, help us to walk in the newness of life. We just don't want to be, don't want to be the people that have faith, oh Lord, but we want our works to be coupled with faith. We want obedience to go hand in hand with faith. And we want to prove our faith with our obedience, Father. We don't want to stay stubborn. Lord, we want to be sensitive to the storms and the fish that you send in our lives. We want to be sensitive to the nudgings and the proddings of your Holy Spirit and the Word and the experiences that you put us in. Father, help us to mend our ways and you be with us, Lord. We look unto you and we ask you to help us and open up our, our eyes of understanding and your ears which are dull of hearing. Father, help us to have a heart that will perceive uh, these things and let the Spirit, Holy Spirit, reveal unto us the deep things of the Lord and reveal unto us that things which are spiritual and help us to put to death the works of the flesh and be with us, Father. Bless all the saints here in the local church and throughout the body of Christ. Bless the ministry throughout, O oh Father. Bless the work going on in the church, Lord, and be with us all. Bless the weekend services throughout the body and help us till we come back on Sunday morning. Be, let his words be a blessing to all the saints of God. And let your work be perfected in our lives. In Jesus' name, I ask and pray. Amen and amen and amen. God bless you.